Yes, it is a very special occasion. Uh, uh, it's going to be a crazy week, but a good one. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and having uh, Novak, Rafa and Andy there obviously um, adds even more uh, to it all. Um, it almost looks like I organized it this way, but I really didn't. Uh, I was uh, just really happy that everybody was eager to play. We have never had Andy on the team. And so having him on the team is going to be very special. I know it especially with what he has gone through in terms of injuries and then I think me too announcing it. I think we have a lot to talk about. Um, Novak and Rafa, of course, great champions and having them on the team feels so good, you know, just knowing that uh, they're going to be there. So um, a, lot, a lot to look forward to. At what point did you realize that the Labour Cup was going to be your last event? Probably only like a month ago. Um, you know, I thought about it before. If this could be it, just felt um, uh, my knee was not going to be good enough to play a tournament, a singles tournament anymore. And honestly, I didn't want to put the, the knee through it anymore. Uh, so the question was really just uh, where to announce it, where could I say goodbye, uh, where could I be um, during the announcement? Because I thought it was important for me not to be a ghost when I announced it and just announce it and then pff, he's not around and he's gone. So, but that there is a... I'm, I'm here, you know, and I'm actually doing okay and I can do some interviews and I can let people know that how much I'm looking forward to my next part of my life and yeah, maybe be able to play something like a doubles or something at the Labour Cup and if I can still help the team a little bit and I asked uh, Bjorn Borg if it was okay if I maybe just play the doubles. He's like, whatever it is, Roger, we are so happy to have you on the team and, um, and so I'll, I'll do that and I'll play doubles on Friday and uh, and yeah, so um, just felt like the Labour Cup was something special for me to be able to say goodbye, Bjorn Borg on the chair, all the other players around, Rod Labour in the arena, just felt very fitting at the end. And London as a city was obviously a, a special a special connection to Wimbledon at the World Tour Finals. How hard and how emotional also was it to accept that your career is going to end now? And were there <clears throat> different stages of acceptance? Definitely, I went through a lot of uh, ups and downs in the sense of uh, emotional moments. Um, it was all good. It's all uh, meant to be. It's all part of the process, you know. Um, and I guess you could almost call it a bit of grieving, you know, um, because I, I will miss uh, the game of tennis. Um, I will miss probably not everything, but 99% of it, you know, uh, I will miss. Um, and I could now name a lot, a lot of things, what they are, uh, but the people know what it could be, and that's what it is. And um, I'm happy I went through those phases of feeling emotional about it, you know? So that's why I can actually sit here, I feel, and actually speak quite relaxed and good about it, uh, because I felt I went through those stages. Um, I think because of it, I will be able to enjoy the weekend much more, instead of being too worried about having to do an interview or speaking to people, meeting people and just getting all too emotional and all worked up about it. At what point did you let Rafa know about your plans? Um, Rafa, I let him know probably 10 days ahead of time. Yeah, because I wanted to let him know that uh, I was maybe going to play doubles if he's going to be there, that obviously that could be very special for, for me if he was going to be there. So, and I just wanted to, to get, get, give him the news as well ahead of time. Rafa obviously came on tour when you were already having big success. How did you see Rafa growing into the man that he is now? Yeah, so I remember him as a young boy coming up on tour, uh, being um, rather shy, you know, very flamboyant and outgoing on the court, but uh, away from it, he was very shy, you know, struggle to get give you the eye contact you know and all that and he always said oh whatever roger wants um i'm happy with that you know and then as the time went by he became a very strong personality more confident as well and obviously had his own uh, one of his own ways which is um, i was happy to see and uh, and then today it's just uh, fascinating to see how through all the rivalries and through all the tough matches that we've had we always keep a, a very strong bond, I guess. It comes from the connection through our, uh, from our parents, um, from uh, our teams, 
And uh, having played so many big matches um, that went either way, um, and I think uh, it's nice today we have a, um, this type of relationship. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much more we, we will see each other in the future, but uh, um, it's been, been nice to be in touch with him, you know, over the course of the last few years, especially where things weren't always as simple for me as, uh, as they maybe seemed. Reflecting on, on Labour Cup, how much did you think it would create this sort of excitement that it did and, and the spotlight from the fans? when it was first launched? I mean, we're celebrating the five-year anniversary of the Labour Cup now. Um, we were talking with Thomas Enquist, um, the coach of, the, of Team Europe, uh, today, and he goes, I can't believe it's been five years. Uh, it really has gone by in a flash. Um, some incredible matches played, some great uh, emotions and moments we ha were able to, to live through. And I'm happy that um, we're able to stay true to uh, where competitors become teammates, you know. I think that's uh, really lived up to the expectations. Um, I feel like we picked some incredible venues. Looking forward to Vancouver next year, Berlin in two years. I think those are great uh, new two new additions. I hope it's going to be fantastic uh, to play there. From what I heard, it's going to the, the arenas are amazing. And uh, for me to be having gone to all of them, I have seen the excitement grow and everybody who has been to the Labour Cup personally uh, or watched on TV, everybody has been pretty much blown away and loved the energy and loved the, the weekend it gives to, to tennis because I think uh, the game of tennis uh, deserves and needs an event like this and uh, I'm happy that uh, there's so many players who actually want to be, take part and I hope they really walk away with um, a lot of things learned, you know, by sharing uh, being on a team with teammates they normally would never be on and uh, then also seeing the, um, the past generation as well, being able to speak to the likes of John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg uh, um, or seeing the young ones coming through. I think it's been a, a very special, special trip so far. I mean, on paper, Team Europe looks unstoppable. How do you think you're going to avoid complacency? Um, we will not avoid complacency. I think we know um, that uh, I am not uh, at my very best. Uh, I think also Andy Murray knows that he's not uh, Andy Murray that he used to be, but he still can uh, offer a lot to team, uh, to team Europe. I think with Rafa and Novak on the team, I think we can be very confident that if they show up and play and uh, perform at their normal level, they're going to be extremely hard to beat. Um, Rude, who's just been on an incredible run, uh, he knows what he's capable of doing, even on faster indoor courts. Uh, Stefanos, he's done very well um, in in the Labour Cup ties. He's uh, won uh, his match against Kyrgios last year. Played fantastic. So, and we can use him very well for the doubles as well. So, I think we know about our chances. Um, Berrettini also, I think indoors, he's going to be very strong. So, I think we're looking very good. And the last thing we do on Team Europe or in tennis in general is going to underestimate anybody because we know about their strength. They have a very strong doubles always. And then indoors, to be honest, best of three with Super Breaker in the third. A lot can happen. Uh, we've won a lot, a lot of close matches over the years. We're always ready for it to change, but hopefully not this year in London. Roger, how important is it for you to stay involved in tennis past your career? Well, I think it would be nice. Um, I don't think it's completely necessary for me to do that, um, but I would miss it. And I can choose probably to be in it a little bit if I want to. The question is how, and that uh, uh, needs to be answered. I have to go into a bunker and uh, think about it, you know, and uh, really uh, think about it, what the, what the future holds. Um, I'm looking forward to the future. I'm going to think about how to stay involved in tennis. Um, but first and foremost, I want to be a good dad, good husband, be home a little bit more um, like I have been in the last uh, couple of years. But um, if it means that I can maybe commentate from time to time, mentor juniors coming through Switzerland uh, in, in, in some shape or form, um, go visiting tournaments, saying thank you and goodbye, uh, and you know just seeing them after all these years. As a, as a friend, um, so there's ways, I guess, uh, I, I, would, I could stay involved. So you would actually consider coaching or mentoring certain players? Yes, I think especially young players. I don't see myself coaching on the tour or anything like that, just because uh, 
I have too many children and I want to be home and uh, I love being in Switzerland. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in a way, I'm, I always feel like I'm a phone call away because over the years I've, uh, I've gotten to learn that giving back and giving advice, if somebody can use it, uh, is, a, is, the, is the greatest feeling on earth. Do you think it'll be hard to you know, not do this on a daily basis, playing tennis? I mean no, it's going to be easy because uh, I haven't played much tennis the last years. So it's been a lot of fitness and that's something I really did not enjoy at the beginning of my career, but I start to enjoy it. So now I like both. So now I have a, a problem, I have to choose between, between going to the gym or onto the, the tennis court. But I really would like to, like what Stefan Edberg once told me, he says, Roger, just always keep on playing, you know, twice a week. Uh, it's good for your body, it's good just, you know, in case you want to play again and it just uh, gives you something to do as well and all that stuff. So I think it's important for me and my body and my brain also to keep on playing tennis and have fun just playing tennis without having to improve something for a change. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, but I'll, I'll keep playing tennis. And you'll keep going to the gym to look this buff. Yes, I actually want to look bigger. Ah, but, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, but uh, actually I had to do so many different ways of training the last um, last few seasons because of the knee. I had to come become really creative and uh, I started to enjoy do, doing different things instead of just always the classic uh, running and agility for work stuff. You have millions of fans around the world that traveled to all these tournaments that you played by the thousands. Um, do you think it'll be hard not being able to give back in the way you did by showing up at tournaments? Yeah, I mean, look, I will miss the fans dearly. Um, they have uh, given me so much. Um, they, look, we, I also, unfortunately, but fortunately, I played during the COVID years as well, quickly. I played French Open night session my last French Open match actually in front of nobody. Um, Halle, tournament I love so much as well against Felix is also basically in front of nobody. And that was tough. Um, I'm happy I did it and I did it well actually considering, but uh, it's really something um, that nobody wants. Uh, but it just gave me a sense of how it would be with nobody. And it was awful. And. Uh, that's where I think we can be so happy that I had, uh, or we all had the chance to play in front of so many people. I think that's been the special part about um, my career potentially, because I feel I had the home court advantage wherever I went. And here comes your guy, almost your local hero, Roger Federer, and I was on the other side of the planet, you know, and that feeling, um, I will never take that for granted. And uh, that applause and people taking time out of their busy schedules, take it money in their hands, say like, okay, I'm going to watch Roger. Um, I appreciate that because they could have done something else on that day and just uh, stay home and have a dinner with friends, but they chose to come watch me play. So it didn't go unnoticed. Do you think you'll miss the applause? Yes and no. Um, you know, I used to get uh, knots in my tummy walking out uh, as well, even though I, maybe I didn't seem nervous, but having night session matches sometimes, you wake up in the morning, wait all day, all day, just wait to walk out. It, it's stressful after a while, you know, and it eats you up a little bit. Uh, so I will not miss that part, but then that walking out part, that'd be nice. But I can get those in exhibition matches and I'm sure I'll play some of them in the future again. It'll be cool to see everybody again. <laughs> As a child, I'm sure you had dreams of what you want to become and what you want to do, what you want to achieve. Um, did you ever dream this big? I really didn't, you know. Um, I see myself um, as a boy uh, making jokes in the garden of my friends, saying like, "And ah, dear Roger Federer wins Wimbledon, you know, and I go to my knees and I'm like, oh yeah, I did win. But it wasn't like, he's gonna win eight times, you know, or he's gonna be world number one, or this is uh, not how my dreams were working. My dreams were working, oh, let's try to get on a, on a big court, let's try to become a professional tennis player. Uh, let's maybe win Wimbledon one time. So, as I'm telling you, uh, totally uh, exceeded all my expectations. You actually did that as a child? Yeah, you went. I did. So you'd be a good announcer. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that sounded perfect. Okay. <laughs> Look. I can do better. This was just a, a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a sample. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just a sample. I have many versions of them. <laughs> would, that, would that be uh, an option to be commentator? 
I, you know, it's funny, six months ago, uh, I all of a sudden said, you know what, maybe a bit of commentating, you know, in selective tournaments, potentially, who knows, if people think I can bring something to the game, yeah. that could be fun. Whereas before I said, no way, would I ever, why would I do that, you know, but uh, I've really come to, to love that former great players give back to the game in a way of commentating, yeah. just because I think it is so much fun when a great former player gives their insights because they know how it feels or what it is like to be out there in a crucial moment. And if if people think uh, that'd be cool, uh, you know, maybe I can consider, but uh, I have no plans yet. So I still have to um, think about it, talk through it and, uh, and then eventually decide, I guess. By the way, is it easier to be a dad or a tennis player? Um, I mean, once you've made it as a professional tennis player, it's easier just to be a professional tennis player, but um, I feel the um, the dad thing is quite the challenge. Just yeah. new, different types of challenges, curveballs coming at you every single day. Um, it's hard. It's really hard, you know, um, because there's no... I guess in tennis also, you cannot go by the book. It's like, okay, in this problem, you say this, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and it's very emotional, emotional driven. Um, as a tennis player, uh, at one point you kind of know what to do and you go through the, um, you go through the whole process um, and, in, uh, and you have a team, you know, that backs you up. And um, as a dad, you feel like you and your wife are just trying to somehow figure it out. And there's a lot of communication that goes into it. And very often you feel it comes in a different way than you expected it. So you have to be super, Nimble, let's call it that way. Oh, wow, I don't want to be a dad now. <laughs> Your theory, you didn't sell it to me. <laughs> but it's still great. But okay. I, I still think being okay. a parent, being a parent is is fun, but really hard. Okay, good. Um, so now that you you know you're such a competitive guy, otherwise you wouldn't have played for this long. How are you going to funnel your competitiveness? Now that I don't need it. I really don't. Um, funny enough, um, as dri yeah, as dri as driven as I uh, I was, I guess um, I never really cared so much if I won in card games or chess or backgammon or ping pong. Or yes, I like to win, but it doesn't need to be. That's why I always laugh if when I see older tennis players, somebody in club matches, they're like, get all worked up when they lose, or in golf, they lose balls, they're like, oh my God, and they throw around their stuff. Uh, I am very much like, oh, okay, just let's have, let's have a good time, let's try to win, but if it doesn't, uh, if you don't win, okay, it's fine. Uh, whereas in tennis, I was different, you know, but it's true, maybe I'll have to find something uh, like that, but uh, at the moment, I, I'm very content just, uh, just doing different things, doing different sports, um, and just having a good time with my friends. Um, so I've heard and I've also seen that you've been quite naughty to your team. You think so? Yeah. Ah, there was play, one, the one video only came out. No, no, no. That was unfortunate also, for me. What you know, what we see behind the scenes. <laughs> ah, okay. You, you play pranks on them, yeah, yeah. you know, you do things. Yeah. Do you think that now that if you're kind of stopping to employ them, that they'll give you back? <laughs> <clears throat> so the thing is, um, I feel like I've always been very nice to them, you know, of course, right. uh, you know, yeah, I wouldn't be any different. But yes, I have tricked them and I have done pranks on them. And the problem is that a lot of them have told me um, that they will be waiting for me around the corner when I announce my last press conference that it's all said and done. So at the moment, they still cannot touch me because I still have a match to go. But once it's all said and done, I am a little bit worried for for myself, uh, um, how it will look like when it's all over, because uh, they are ready, and uh, the problem is they are um, they have been waiting long enough. So it's <laughs> something's building, something's cooking. But uh, no, look, I've been fortunate enough to have an unbelievable team. We had a lot of fun. Um, they made fun of me. We've made fun of each other, and it's yeah. been it's been all good, you know. But uh, let's see when it's all said and done. Was the best prank you've played? On I that? don't know. Uh, I, I like so to, many. I like to hide. I, I like to scare people. I even go on YouTube sometimes and check out how people react when they get scared. You know, there's these <laughs> funny, com funny yeah. compilations. It's hilarious. It just uh, still um, cracks me up every time.